Yes. Well, I'm curious where the idea for this book came from. I mean, what got you into arson? <laughs> 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 That's spoken like a true arsonist type. Uh, we try. Yeah, right. Well, thank you. Uh, there's a support group after the reading. Uh, I'm not interested in arson at all, unfortunately. I mean, I was never one of these kids who were on the playground with their magnifying glass torching ants, uh, although I admired those kids. I, I, I went to this, the Emily Dickinson house when I was a college senior on a field trip. Uh, the class I'd been taking was in Emily Dickinson, her poetry, which poetry I loved. And the house didn't seem to have anything to do with what I loved about the poetry. It's your basic sort of creaky old New England house. And, and I'm, I'm bothered, pissed off by a number of obscure, ridiculous things. And this just happened to be one of them that it sort of stuck with me over the years. Why do we go to this house uh, where we could be just reading the book? And, uh, and then you know, I accumulate other things along, along the way. I became interested in packaging scientists and uh, memoir. And I've always been interested in New England. And these things just sort of coalesced. Uh, but plus, everyone does like fire. I mean. Everyone likes it. I mean, I, I dare someone to tell me that they don't. Uh, and so that became a part of the novel because I needed stuff to be destroyed, and fire was the most man-made of the elements that I could summon. So, bad answer to a good question. <laughs> someone had their hand up back there. I, I just want to know about other projects. Say again, please. Other projects that you may be working on or thinking about. I'm working on a biography of Sarah Palin right now. <laughs> I'm working on a novel called Exley. It's about this uh, fantastic writer who wrote, uh, named Frederick Exley, who wrote a great book in the late 60s called The Fans Notes. He was this notorious drunken liar and, uh, who lived in upstate New York. And uh, his life has always fascinated me, in part because it's hard to get a real fix on what the life was like. Um, because he has his own versions of the life, and people who had their lives affected by him, normally, usually negative, had their own versions of his life. So uh, it's a novel in some way regarding him. And he lived in a an army town called Watertown in upstate New York. It's where Fort Drum is. And uh, in some ways, it's a kind of army book in a way. I mean, it's, you know, it's not like the way I'm describing it. Uh, you know, there are, there are very few men in uniforms in the book. Uniforms? Uniform in the book. But it sort of casts a pall over the whole town. It's the most bizarre town. My wife and son and I were there recently, and it's everyone there is dif disfigured in some way, or demented, uh, or stunted. It's a great place to set a novel, but a terrible place to live. So uh, I'd rather write a novel there, I guess, than live there. I know I'm a great salesman for the book. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? Yeah. Towards the, I guess, three quarters through the book, there's that scene um, where the family is, call, they're calling each other strange names, and he calls them Coleslaw. Coleslaw, right. What is, I don't know, where, how did you come up with that? What is It comes from a bunch of things it mean. <laughs> Uh, the name Coleslaw, I'm not even sure where I got that. A friend of my brother's name was nickname was Coleslaw, and I have no idea where he got the nickname, but when they got drunk, they called him Coleslaw, which I loved. Uh, the other part of the nickname, the, for those of you who don't know, there's a scene there where Sam goes to meet his estranged in-laws. They're at his house that Sam's been kicked out of, and they're all sitting around this table uh, wearing Middle Eastern gear. Uh, Arab gear, and they call it the, his father-in-law calls him coleslaw, and and um, this comes from a couple things. One, when I lived in Clemson, South Carolina. We used to be invited to these parties that had ethnic themes. So, for instance, the party would be Middle Eastern, and you were you were assigned a dish. So once this party, my wife and I were assigned couscous, which we made or she made, and. Uh, we went there, and this guy opens the door. We didn't know these people very well. What we knew of them, we loathed. And um, we hope, in fact, we were just about to have a kid, and they all had kids, and afterwards we were like, God, do we, are we going to have to do this until he goes to college? But anyways, he opens the door. This guy, we ring the doorbell. The door opens, and there's a guy about six feet tall, beefy guy, wearing kind of baggy, crazily patterned weightlifter pants, and no shoes, no shirt, and a towel on his head. Uh, and he looks at us and says, Bula, 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 as though he's a Muslim at prayer time. And they used to have these parties, these the ethnic theme parties. So there was another one, a German party, where the guy came to the door wearing Speedos and leather sandals and nothing else. Um, so part of it was based on this, and part of it was my wife's family who are obsessed with these moments in the past. Like, someone will dress up as a cowboy when they were four. And then during his 70th birthday party, everyone will have to then dress as cowboys to celebrate this shining moment in their past. And 
all that sort of came together. But ba again, basically, I just wanted to write a scene in which this guy was being called coleslaw, and he didn't know why. <laughs> yeah, because you know, a, I couldn't figure out how to write a scene to emphasize how estranged this guy actually was from the family. So the only way I could figure it out was to have them call them, him this name and him not be able to figure out why. Did you hate the scene? Because my editor wanted to take it, wanted to take it out, and the guy who's here, Michael Griffith, ins demanded, insisted that I leave it in. There's so many students here who have had me in class. I don't want to shoot my wad right now. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I actually don't have many. I mean, I, it's not a very talismanic thing for me. I just get up in the morning. I take my son to the bus when it's my turn to do so, and then I sit down and write for a few hours, and then I do something else uh, when I, or I go teach or whatever else I have to do. There's nothing. I don't know. There's nothing too crazy about it for me, at least. I mean, I know other people have different rituals, but. You know, and it's much harder as it is for everyone at the beginning because I don't know what I'm doing, so I bang away for a while, and hopefully sooner or later something starts working. And if it doesn't, I sort of I put it away for a while and then come back to it later on. But again, nothing, unfortunately, nothing groundbreaking. Uh, I know I had this story. I heard this story about this writer whose name escapes me, Midwestern Kent Haruf or Harif, I forgot his name. Where apparently he wrote this book called I don't know. It's a one word even song, maybe not it. It doesn't matter what it was. It was a famous plain song, plain song. And apparently he would go into his earthen basement and put pantyhose over his head and then write. And I could never, he didn't want any distractions. I was like, how does the panty, isn't the pantyhose a distraction? Plus, who wears pantyhose anymore? I mean, where would he get a pair? Uh, so I, it's too complicated for me. I just, I don't do that. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. I really appreciate you coming. Thanks a lot. <laughs>